No, it's a it's a blessing to be able to get together and have church again. Amen. And, uh, we just thank you for the opportunity, and we trust that our lesson will be a blessing to you. Now, as you recall, well, let, let me just go ahead and say this. We, we start a brand new series of lessons today, and of course, it's a study of the New Testament. We'll be going through the New Testament for a while, and uh, just like we did the story of the Old Testament, where we, I mean, very quickly went through the Old Testament, <laughs> and uh but the title of our lesson today, of course, is The Messiah Come. And we'll be studying from the books of Matthew, Luke, and John. But uh, as, as you look back over the studies we had under the uh, title of uh, we saw, or we was able to see that the studies centered on the theme of God's plan to redeem mankind from sin and from the effects of of the sin that uh, the fall of man that sin caused. You know what I'm trying to say. And of course, we started out uh, that series lesson with uh, how it began, how it all began. In other words, we talked about the creation, uh, how he created the world and everything in it, and mankind, and, and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and then uh, we discussed how, how the uh, well, we talked about the sin of mankind, of course, and that was the reason that you know, that that's what the story is about. You know, even man that, that fought failed. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after uh, that, we talked about how God uh, made a nation out of, out of nothing. In other words, he called Abraham and uh, just him and his wife. He didn't have a child at all. God said, I'm going to make your seed. as a seed. And we saw how God done that. And then we uh, discussed how uh, God uh, a dynasty of kings for the people. You know, they requested a king in Samuel's day. And gave them what they asked for. And then uh, we discussed how God uh, divided that. It was a 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Under Saul, David, and Solomon. But then they were divided under uh, Solomon's son, real boy became two nations. <clears throat> and of course, uh, after studying that, we, we studied from the books of wisdom and more wisdom. But those books of wisdom are special. They give us wisdom for living practical life. In other words, they tell us how we can live to please God. And that's what we need to look into. We need to learn how we can please God. Of course, uh, after, after that lesson, then we read about where God sent his messengers to the uh, children of Israel, both nations, the northern and the southern kingdom, staying away from God. And he sent his messengers, the prophets, uh, to call them back to repentance, to turn back to God and serve him. And then, of course, uh, in those lessons, we talked about how God brought his people into captivity them from their country because they sinned and rebelled against him and would not repent. And of course the northern kingdom as a result of their rebellion and sin uh, they went into uh, captivity to the Assyrians and that was in about 722 BC. And, uh, uh, and then about uh, well looking at the southern kingdom then now the southern kingdom had an advantage over the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom had a few good kings. And as a result, um, they provided uh, God's word to the people, and, and it did make a difference. Uh, for uh, uh, They did have periods of revival and, and renewal during the times of those good kings. But we find that it was short-lived. In 586 B.C., then the Babylonians uh, came in, and they captured the southern kingdom, and this was only 136 years after the northern kingdom went into captivity. And that's the reason I said these few good kings that led the nation into revival and renewal, God smiled on that. God pleased with that. And he was uh, patient with them for 136 additional years before he carried the southern kingdom into captivity. And then uh, after that, uh, they were in captivity for 70 years. Uh, we see that, uh, well, let me say this. Whenever the Babylonians came in and, and uh, carried the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity, 
that was basically the end of the Davidic, Davidic <coughs> dynasty of kings. You know, God had promised David as long as there was a throne in Israel, his son would reign on the throne. But since that time, see, there's not really been a king in Israel. They haven't had a king. Hey, don't worry. There is a king coming. There's a king coming. Oh, yeah. And he's going to reign on the throne of David, too. Amen. But uh, uh, for the for the people there and, and all, basically it was the end of the dynasty of kings. <clears throat> and and you might say it was the death of the They had been given a land that they didn't even have to work for. God just gave it to them. And yet they, they blew it. And they had to go into captivity because of their rebellion and their sin. And uh, as a result of that, you might say the, the nation was, was basically dead. Uh, but I wanted to say that that don't end the story. God through Jeremiah told the people in Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 11, he said, you're going to go into captivity and that captivity will last for 70 years. And Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And uh, and they did. They, they was in captivity for 70 years. But you know what? God didn't stop there. He gave the people a message of hope as well. In the very next verse, in Jeremiah chapter 25, and verse 12, this is what he told them. He said, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. In other words, after that 70 year period is, is through, after it's, after it's been accomplished. Then I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. And that's what happened. At the end of the 70 year period, in about 539 BC, the Medo Persians, they overthrew the Babylonian kingdom and began to reign. And it was the very next year after they had overthrew the, well, it was in the same year, but it was the following year in 538, if, if they, that they allowed the exiles to return to their homeland and begin to rebuild the temple. So God didn't forget his promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and everybody else. You know what I'm trying to say? He remembered the covenant he had made with them. He had promised them that they'd go back home, and that's what happened. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, as I said, many of the people probably thought that uh, rise again. But I'm telling you, God is not just a, a dead person, but he's able to resurrect a, na a nation. Oh, yeah. And he did that. If you will look at uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and that's what we would have studied last week if we'd have had Sunday school, we would have studied their return from exile. And in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we talk about how God resurrected that nation, or the two nations of, of Judah and Israel again, actually, and, and brought them back to their land. And uh, I wanted to uh, refer to a, uh, a verse of, well, I ain't going to read it where it's at and, and you can read the chapter and, and of course you'll recognize it when I tell you but in Ezekiel chapter 37 you know the story of the dry bones yeah. Yeah. this was the nation of Israel this was God's chosen people they was dead but God brought them back out of captivity and he raised up that nation again he resurrected the nation of Israel again and Ezra and Nehemiah tells us all about that and uh, we, uh, uh, in that lesson, we read about Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, the priest, coming back. They was the first ones to return with a group. Uh, I want to think it was about uh, 50,000 people that came with them. But anyway, there was a great number of them that chose to come back. And they started rebuilding the temple, and then, of course, they had uh, opposition to arise against them. But God sent them some prophets. He sent the prophet Haggai and the prophet Zechariah who encouraged them to go back to work. And, and they did eventually. They went back to work and, and they finished the temple. And, and it was about 20 years after they started the construction of it that they finally finished the temple and began to have worship. And then, of course, uh, after that, uh, God sent Malachi. Malachi. Let me say this about Nehemiah, because he was part of the lesson last week too. 
God dealt with Nehemiah going back and building the wall around the city. You see, the city was still in bad shape, still in, in, in you know, in turmoil, and still open to all the enemies to come in and, and just destroy the people. So God dealt with Nehemiah, and he, and he prayed, and God gave him favor with the king, and he went back and led a group back, and, and they began to work on the walls. And, of course, they had opposition, too, but I believe it was in 52 days they completed the construction of the wall. 50 something days, I think it was 52. <laughs> but anyway, in a short period of time, because they were determined to obey God and look to God for their help, they were able to build a wall. And then after that all happened, God sent the prophet Malachi to the people, and, and just like the other prophets, his, his message was, turn back to God. It seemed like the people had got complacent, and they had not wanted to serve God like they wanted to. They, they began to put self on the throne. To, them, to prophesy to them to turn back to him. And uh, of course, uh, uh, many responded positively to Malachi's message, and many didn't. But those that did, God blessed them. But what I want to point out here in all this, even though some of the people uh, was not faithful to God, he did not forget that he had promised that he was going to send the Messiah into the world. And we're going to start our lesson on that today, but before we do, I wanted to make a uh, mention of this. Uh, from the, of course, the book of Malachi was the last book in the Old Testament, and it's probably the last book written from whatever since it took place after the exiles went back home, and, and, he, and he called the exiles to repent. The time that Malachi prophesied and wrote his book, so the time in the New Testament that Matthew wrote his book, or I won't say wrote his book, but the time we get to Matthew's uh, time in history, uh, is what they call the intertestamental period. And uh, this was a period of a little more than 400 years, as I understand it. that out to say, you know, no, no prophecy taking place during this 400 year period of time. That had to be a dark season for the world at that time. But God had forgot his promise. He said he was going to send the Messiah, and he did. And in our lesson today, it's entitled, The, the Messiah Come. And I want to go back to something I said earlier. You know, the Old Testament story that we read, it focused on God's plan for the redemption of mankind. Then the story of the New Testament, then, that we're going to take up today, it focuses on the fulfillment of that plan that was revealed to us in the Old Testament. It's God's fulfilling of the plan that he laid out in the Old Testament. And I hope that we'll be able to see that. <clears throat> now, in our lesson today, the Messiah comes, and whatever you think about the Messiah comes, of course, you think about his birth. But we can't just spend all our time on the birth, although I'll spend a pretty good bit of that time there. We're going to talk about not only his birth, but we're going to talk about an event in his childhood. We're going to talk about his baptism. We're going to talk about a couple of things during his ministry, some of the ways he ministered to people. We're going to talk about his death. We're going to talk about his burial, and we're going to talk about his resurrection. We're going to cover the life of Christ, is what I'm trying to say. And we're going to start Matthew chapter 1 with his birth. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now that's Isaiah 7, 14, if you want to read it. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, get back to the theme of the Old, Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. 
the plan to redeem fulfilled. What I have to do, I guess, is think about Adam and Eve. You know, God created Adam and Eve and he put them in the Garden of Eden. And think about it. There was no sin in them. They was in a sinless environment. But yet, when Satan entered into the serpent and tempted them, then of course they committed the sin. But you know what? God was not caught by surprise. This didn't catch God by surprise. You might, you might seem to think sometimes that it might, but it didn't. I want, I want to read something to you that one writer said, and I, I thought it was so good, and, and I want to share it with you. <clears throat> one writer said this, Although God did not foreordain sin, he did foreknow it. <laughs> hey, that's good news, y'all. And in foreknowing sin, he prepared for its eradication. One day, sin's going to be done away with. Do you know that? That's going to be wonderful. Then. Well, how did he do this? Of course, he did that by sending his son to give his life as a sinless, perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. <clears throat> now, we looked at God's plan for, for redeeming the world as we went through the story of the Old Testament, as we've already said. And now we're going to look at the revelation of that plan in Jesus Christ. And make no mistake about it. Now, I want to tell you this. Jesus is the plan. Yes. Yes. Jesus is the plan. Yes. He's not one Savior among many. He is the only Savior. Amen. Yes. And so we need to know that. Jesus is the plan. He is the Savior. And, 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 uh, uh, Chapter 4, verse 12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 1 John chapter 5, verse and This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's, that's simple, ain't it? Yes. It's in Jesus Christ, and we need to realize that. Now, of course, Matthew here provides us a record of the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of the promised Messiah. And there was many of them in the Old Testament. Uh, but I, I wanted to point out some of the details of the things that, that Matthew uh, lists for us. And I, one of the things I want to mention is the obedience of Joseph. You know, uh, he was in a, a bad situation. He was engaged to a girl. And come to now, what was he going to do? He was fixing to put her away. He was he was going he was going to do it quietly, but he was going to put her away. But God spoke to him and said, "Don't fear to take this woman." You know what? He was obedient. He took his wife to her. He, he took her. And then another thing that Matthew tells us that's a very much important, and that's he made sure that we understood that this child was born of a virgin. This was a virgin birth. Now, there's a lot of people don't believe in that. Don't believe that happened. They don't believe it could happen, but it happened. I don't think it's ever happened again, but it happened. And I thank God for it. Now, uh, Matthew not only uh, uh, pointed it out, but he even quoted Isaiah's words that said, that, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And, and so he was very careful to let us know it was a... a born of a virgin. Now, why was he so careful to point out that truth to you? Well, let me put it this way. If Jesus had been born of a natural human father, if Joseph had been his natural human father, he would have inherited an old sin nature. Sin nature. And he couldn't have been the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Yeah. So he had to be born of a virgin. Yes. in order to be the perfect sacrifice for my, my and your sin. It's the foundation of the Christian doctrine of salvation. Virgin birth? Well, let me just say it like this. Our doctrine of salvation, our belief in, in salvation, it rises or it falls on the virgin birth. So that's why it is so uh, now, another thing that Isaiah points out here is that 
virgin would conceive and bear a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God. Well, I'm going to say it like this. This is a strong statement, in my opinion, of the deity of Jesus Christ. God with us. God became flesh. John chapter 1. And he talks about the deity of Christ here. God's son, he was fully man when he came into this world, but he was fully God too. So he, he, was, uh, he talks about the deity of Christ there. And I wanted to, I wanted to read this, but God alone. But what they didn't realize was God was standing right in their presence, mm -hmm. in the in the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, that's good stuff, ain't it? Sure, sure. So Jesus, the Son of God, He's fully God. He's fully man, but he... and as such, He had the power and authority to forgive. He still reserves that power today. He can forgive any soul that will come to him in repentance. We as finite human beings, we have a hard time wrapping our mind about a lot of this. But I tell you, it's, it's real. This is good. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And I think I done read that, but I'm going to read it again. First, ain't no question about that. It was a miraculous birth. But now we want to also talk about uh, some things that uh, happened during Jesus' childhood. We can go look at his life a little bit. And there was one instance that's recorded in the Bible for us in the book of Luke. Uh, uh, and, and we want to look at this. In Luke chapter 2, uh, I want to read verses 41 through. It says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went as they journeyed. And they saw him among their friends. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, Luke here reiterates something that I think Matthew uh, spoke to us about. That was the, the righteousness and the goodness and, and of, of Jesus' earthly parents, Joseph and Mary. We talked about Joseph being obedient to God and all that stuff. And of course, his mother uh, was all a good woman. She wouldn't have been chosen of God to, to bear the Son of God if she hadn't been a good woman. But uh, Luke sort of reiterates that same thing for us here. Because we, we look and see that they lived in strict obedience to the commands of the law at this time. And they were still under the dispensation of the law at this time before the cross, you know. They were still under the law. To live in strict obedience to the requirements of the law. And, and I believe they lived in strict obedience to the command as to how they raised their and so they taught Jesus just like they would of any other child. And and in the account that we find in this uh, record that we just read there, we find that they go up to Jerusalem. And they're traveling with some of their family and acquaintances and friends and whatever else. And uh, they were going to celebrate the feast of the Passover. <clears throat> now, this particular trip, and probably the reason it was recorded for us, rather than the times when he was one or two and three and four years old, all that kind of stuff. But this one was when he was 12 years old. This was special because at the age of 12, we're told that uh, most Jewish males, at the age of 12, they go through a... Talk about their customs, really talk about it. But they go through a ceremony in which they're uh, introduced into adulthood. They're given adult responsibilities at this age. Today they call this uh, ceremony or this event the Bar Mitzvah. And I may not be pronouncing those words correctly either. But this was special because this was the time that they went up and, and they went through this procedure with Jesus. <clears throat> and, and we don't know how long they stayed in Jerusalem at this time. I know Passover is one day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread follows immediately after the Feast of Passover. And it lasts for seven days. In that time frame, they might have had this bar 
<laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to say, they probably stayed eight plus days in Jerusalem. And then whenever it came time, it says when the days were filled, uh, they started back home. And, and they went a day's journey before they found out that Jesus weren't in their midst. Now, somebody might say, well, how could that have happened? <laughs> well, Mary might have thought he was with Joseph, and Joseph might have thought he was Mary. They tell me that in, that, in groups that travel like that, that the women and the children would, would uh, go together as a group, and the men and the older boys would go together as a group. So it's very easy that they could have missed him that way. But anyway, uh, uh, what we're going to say is this. <clears throat> Uh, at the end of the first day's travel, I guess they was going to make count for the night or something. They got to looking for Jesus and couldn't find him. Well, uh, they asked all their kinfolk and acquaintance, and, and, and nobody had seen him. Well, they went one day toward home, and I'll say it like this probably the next day they went right back to Jerusalem. Went back or not, but Mary and Joseph went back. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the next day, they hunted for him until they found him. And you know where they found him at? Yes, in the house of God. In the temple. And he was talking to the, supposedly the educated people of that day. People that supposed to know a lot. And, and of course, the Bible implies to me that they were amazed at the wisdom and knowledge that Jesus had. And, and, and we would have been too. We, we ain't uh, But uh, <clears throat> whenever Mary and Joseph found him. Mary kind of scolded. Well, I won't use the word scolded. Why have you done this? You know, we, we would probably not be as graceful as Mary was. You've done this. We, we've been sorrowing. I mean, you caused a lot of anxiety and worry and fear come upon us. I simply asked her with this question. <clears throat> Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now, let's think about what's implied in Jesus' question here. First off, to me, he understood what his father's business was. Mary and Joseph evidently hadn't considered that. They hadn't given thought to it very much. So Jesus had more insight as to why he was even his parents said. Now, you think about that. Him just 12 years old at the time. But anyway, uh, he knew himself, he knew in himself that he had been sent to this world on a special mission, and that was to redeem man from sin. And so it, it shows that Jesus understood better than his parents did that he was on, you know, he had a, uh, he was sent to this world for <coughs> And it says he was uh, sent, uh, well, let's just put it like this. His purpose was to do the Father's will. He said, wish ye not that I must be about my Father's business. And of course, Father's business is to to do the Father's will, and it was the Father's will to bring redemption to fallen man. In Hebrews chapter 10, it repeats it two times, in verse 7 and verse 9. It says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. God had not only decreed through Moses, put it that way, that Christ should come and be the great high priest of the church, but that he'd also offer up a perfect and a perfecting sacrifice. You see, by his perfect sacrifice, he perfects us. He removes sin from us. Now, we have to stay on our knees to keep it removed. You know what I mean? But, but he perfects us. You think about that. We can never be nothing but for the Christ, his saving mercy. And like I said, Mary and Joseph didn't comprehend all that Jesus would have to do in order to save the world from sin. Uh, but Jesus sort of understood this. And uh, think about Mary and Joseph. They may have shared the views of many of the Jews of their time. You know, most of the Jews of their time thought when the Messiah came that he would uh, uh, set up his kingdom, he would overthrow the Roman Empire, and he'd rule on the throne of David, rule over the children of Israel. But God's timing was not then to do that. Now, that will happen. That will happen, yes. but it wasn't yet. And Jesus realized that. So what did he do? The Bible says in verse 51, since he knew it, that that was not the time for him to do that, it, it said there that he uh, came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. 
But his mother kept all these sins in her heart. But And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature with God and man. So Jesus knew this, and therefore he became submissive uh, to his parents. And um, so the next thing I we want to look at is a few more events that took place in the life of Jesus. First thing we're going to look at is his, is his baptism in water. It says, now, and this is Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. It says, now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. Now, I, will, I wanted to point out some things there. That one says, now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus weren't the only one there that day. They had a big baptismal service. There was a bunch of folks got baptized that day. And after all these others were baptized, of course, John baptized the gospel record a little bit, but uh, he told John, he said, suffer it to be so, because I'm here to fulfill all righteousness. And, and, so he, uh, and, and so he baptized Jesus. But my question is this. Did all these other people that submitted to baptism uh, let John baptize him. Did they hear Jesus' prayer? Did they witness the heavens open? Mm. Did they witness the Spirit descend like a dove and light on Jesus? Did they hear God speak from heaven and say, This is my beloved Son, in him I am well pleased? Well, the Bible don't tell us, but I tell you what surprised me if they didn't. What surprised me a bit. A lot of things happened in Jesus' life that amazed people. Think about this. That would have amazed people, wouldn't it? If they'd have scared all of this and seen all of this taking place. And there's a couple other points now I want to make here about this. John's ministry, of course, was to baptize with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. You say, now why did you point that out? Jesus didn't need to repent of any sin. He was sinless. Who knew no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. So why did he submit to, uh, bat to the water baptism? Well, like, like I said, he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness or to show that he was submissive to the Father's will. And not only that, but he wanted to identify, he wanted to align himself with all the people that he would later save that would turn to him. You see, when Jesus saves us, he wants us to be baptized too. So he did it. To, he set the example for us that we could follow his steps. Now, another thing I wanted to point out here is this. <clears throat> Notice that it said there that the Holy Ghost descended on Jesus in a, in a visible form, in, like a dove. Now, what's significant about this? Well, don't forget, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And as man, he needed that anointing. Does man need anointing? Yes. yes. If we're going to do the ministry of God, we need that anointing going. Yes. And so as man, he, he was baptized, and the Spirit come upon him, him and empowered him for his ministry. He became God's instrument to do the things that he done. <clears throat> now, as I said, uh, well, let me just read this verse of Scripture to you. It says it better than I can. Acts 10 and 38 says this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Mm -hmm. So he needed that anointing. If we expect to do anything for God, we've got to have that anointing too. Amen. Now then, another thing I wanted to point out here is that the entire Godhead, the divine trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they were all present at this occasion when Jesus was Baptized of John in Jordan. The Holy Ghost, as a dove, descended on him. The Father spoke from heaven, saying, This is my son. I'm pleased with him. Mm. So the divine trinity was here present at this event. <clears throat> now, let's go on uh, a little further here. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the other events in the life of Jesus. His preaching, his teaching, and his miracles. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse 14 through 21. 
And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened, were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, now listen to what he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In your ears, yeah. <clears throat> now, let me say this. After Jesus' baptism in Jordan, if you continue reading there, what you're going to find is that he was immediately led into the wilderness and there was tempted for 40 plus days. And then, of course, after he got the victory over the devil in the wilderness there, he returned to Galilee and there he began to preach and to teach and and and. You might say he began to perform miracles and, and a lot of other things. But when he came to his hometown of Nazareth, he went to the synagogue, and there is where he read the, those verses that were just read. He read from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. And these verses talk about what the Messiah would do when he came. And uh, uh, he proclaimed to this congregation, and, and I like what he said here, this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Now, what, what was he saying here? This day, Jesus was openly proclaiming that he was the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. He said, I am the Messiah. He was revealing himself to the people that he was teaching here in this congregation. <clears throat> now, of course, Jesus' ministry was mainly to address the spiritual needs of people. Of course, that was the reason he came into this world, to redeem the world from sin. But then, this other part of man, in other words, he came to minister to the whole man, body, soul, and spirit. And of course, we're going to look at some of those uh, things now. And if you'll drop down to verse 31 through 37 in uh, Luke chapter 4, and I'm not going to read those verses, but what we're going to see is, we're going to see that Jesus uh, ministered to a man who was possessed with uh, more than one demon. He was, he was demon possessed by several demons. And after the demons, demons saw Jesus, of course, they uh, told him, they said, let us alone. Well, Jesus, he silenced him. He said, hold your peace or something to that effect. And he, anyhow, shut it. And then he cast him out of the man. And, uh, you know, uh, the result of, of this great miracle, you know, look at how that the people acknowledged the power and the authority by which Jesus spoke and acted. In other words, Luke chapter 4, verse 37, I'll read these two verses. And they were all amazed and said, the word is this, for with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. <clears throat> well, when we go into Luke chapter 5, we're going to see another situation here. Uh, and this is a, a familiar story, and we, we done mentioned it briefly. But uh, there was a man that was uh, afflicted with palsy, or he had paralysis. He was paralyzed. And four men come along and, and bring, brought him to Jesus. And they couldn't get to him because there were so many people around him. But what they done, they tore part of the roof off and let him down in front of Jesus. And you know the story. When, when he didn't say, be healed. You know what he said? Thy sins be forgiven thee. And boy, this made the religious leaders mad. They didn't like that at all. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus then asked them a question. He said, whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. Which would be easier? Well, there's no record that they ever answered his question. But Jesus then turned to the man that was sick and uh, and said, Rise, take up that bed and, or couch or whatever it was and, and go thy way. And the man immediately obeyed the command of Jesus. He got up and walked. And of course, uh, 
So then the religious leaders, they began to uh, call Jesus a blasphemer and all other kind of things. But think about this. They saw something that day they had never seen before. They said, we've seen strange things. In other words, what, what did they mean there? No doubt they were saying, we've never seen anything like this before. Mm. You know, they saw a man that was paralyzed, healed. And what their conclusion was, based on Jesus' question, which would be easier, to, to heal the man or to forgive his sin? And based on their conclusions as to what they saw, they said, well, if he can heal a man that's paralyzed, he can forgive sins as well. And that was the point that Jesus was trying to get them to see. And then notice how that ends up. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. So the people had seen things happen that to them would have been impossible. In the natural, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, history, I guess you could say, uh, but his works enraged the religious leaders. And they saw how they might take him and, and do away with him. And they finally uh, brought him before Pilate. You know the situation there. Now, Pilate said, well, I don't find no fault with this man, but, you know, they still wanted to, wanted him to have him killed. And finally, Pilate gave him to their pressure, and he turned them over, turned Jesus over to the Roman soldiers, and they crucified him. John chapter 19, I want to read this. In, uh, verses 16 through 18, it says, Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away, and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either one side, and Jesus in the midst. And then drop down to verse 28 through 30, and I'll read this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, put it on fire. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So Jesus was crucified, and he gave his life for our sins. Isaiah chapter 53 prophesied about the suffering. And it's pretty vivid, too, if you go back there and read Isaiah's word. And, and it, sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend why that Jesus would have to die, why it was necessary to die in order to save us. But think about it like this. God has always used a substitute to save. Think about Adam and Eve. What did God do? He killed some animals to cover their nakedness, to cover the nakedness of their sin. Think about when God told Abraham to offer Isaac up as an offering unto him. What did he do? When Isaac, just, I mean, just before Abraham killed his son, what did God do? He stopped him. And he saw a ram that God used as a substitute to take Isaac's place. Well, God used Jesus. He provided Jesus as mine and your substitute mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have to die, but he could die for us. He took our sin. He took the penalty of our sin for us. So I thank the Lord for that. But let me say this now. The Roman soldiers, they crucified Jesus. But let me tell you this. They didn't take his life. They did not. John chapter 19 no, John chapter 10, verse 18. This is what it says. No man taketh it, my life, from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. We serve a great God. Don't great, God. Amen. great God. Great God. Great Savior. Now, now, after assuring that Jesus was John chapter uh, 19, verses 28 through 37. I'm not going to take the time to read that. But two men, they were secret disciples of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the one that went to Jesus by night. They took the body of Jesus uh, and, and buried it in a new tomb. But God's work was still not complete. He came to give his life for our sins, but you know what? It wouldn't have been completed if he just stayed in the grave. Right. That's right. The work was not complete. There was another event that had to take place in order to... Uh, complete God's work of salvation. And of course, that was the resurrection of his body. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ has rocked the religious world from that day to now. There's still people that don't believe it. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. But it's a fact. You know, he was seen by many witnesses after his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Many eyewitnesses. There ain't no better proof than an eyewitness of him. But anyway, let me just say this. Uh, all four Gospels record the resurrection of Jesus. Yes. And the resurrection of Jesus, it validated his life's ministry and his death. You know what would have happened if he hadn't raised from the dead? We'd still been in our sin. Oh, our faith would have been in vain. That's what Paul said. Fifteen. Thank God. Thank God he came forth from the grave. So it's it's the resurrection of Jesus on which our hope is established. We wouldn't have any hope if it, if it weren't for his resurrection. That is this hope that we have because he came forth from the grave. It helps us as believers today anticipate the return of Jesus and the resurrection of all believers. That includes me and you. Yeah. Amen. Because he lives, we can live also. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I, I trust that you've got something out of the lesson. I, I know I have to go fast. These these lessons is they pack more into one Sunday than we usually have four or five for. Them. But I thank God that we could go through it real quick, and, and I trust that something's been said that, that's been a blessing to you. May the Lord richly bless you. Daddy's favorite verse was that same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave. It's going to quicken us. <laughs> it's going to raise us. Up.